Hello, everyone. It's Dan Sandick here from the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Thanks very much for joining us for our second uh, Friday Forum of the Year. Uh, we're very happy to have Jackie Yip here, who's going to be giving a, a presentation uh, entitled Robust Impact Patterns and Approach to Account for Uncertainties in Local Sea Level Rise Vulnerability Assessment. Uh, Jackie Yip is a consequence analyst at Kerwood Legal. Uh, she uh, completed her PhD from uh, UBC's Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability. And the work she'll be talking about today was actually part of her, her PhD work that was conducted in partnership with the, uh, the city of Vancouver. Uh, and we know that uh, Dr. Yip has been involved in many other coastal hazards, climate vulnerability, and resilience uh, projects. So she's got a wealth of, of knowledge, and we're very happy to have her with us uh, today. Uh, just a reminder for those of you, or uh, for those of you who haven't joined in the past, um, we'll be collecting questions throughout the webinar. So please uh, use the question uh, function in the webinar uh, uh, software. And we'll collect all the questions and uh, have a discussion at the end of the webinar uh, with Jackie. Um, there's no need to wait till the end of the webinar to ask questions, however, just feel free to ask questions throughout and, uh, and we'll have a good discussion at, at the end. Um, and before, right before I pass it over to, uh, uh, to Jackie, uh, just a quick note that on March 22nd, we'll have our next Friday forum and we'll have Julian Brimelow from Environment and Climate Change Canada will be talking to us about uh, some uh, hail work that he's been involved with. Um, so thanks again for joining, and uh, we're looking forward to Jackie's presentation. And with that, I will pass it over to Jackie. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dan, and thank you to ICLR for this opportunity to present my work here at this forum. I look forward to all the questions and, and hearing your feedback. So as Dan mentioned, I have finished my PhD last year and joined the summer adaptation team at Kerwood Legal. Um, but today's presentation will focus on my PhD research study that I did with Professor Stephanie Chang at UBC and in partnership with the City of Vancouver. So the main goal of the study was really to develop a approach to help policymakers to consider the local level sea level rise impacts um, across a wide range of features. So the study has three parts, which forms um, the three parts of this presentation. So the first part really is to introduce the method that we developed. Um, so as I said, it's really to help policymakers to consider not only the sea level rise impacts over perhaps one best projection of the future, but both a wide range of them. And the idea is really to provide a basis for them to develop adaptation options that can be more robust to the uncertainties in the long-term future. So to demonstrate the applicability of the method itself, um, we applied it at the city of Vancouver to assess the potential syllabi impact there. And often as researchers, we, we think that we develop a tool and we believe that it would be useful in, in help supporting the solving of a certain problem. But um, sometimes it's not the case. So in the third part of our study, we really wanted to um, bring this back to the potential users, in this case, our different experts at the city of Vancouver, to assess the usability of this type of information and the limitations um, to try to see this is actually <laughs> do what we intended it to, to do. So, um, so I'll start with the first part, providing some context. So as we know, many global, well, globally, many coastal cities around the world are facing increasing coastal flood risk, not only due to changing climate, the changing nature of storms, but also because of the growing concentration of population and assets in the coastal areas. So we're putting more at risk while the nature of the hazard itself is changing. And sea level rise is one of the most certain effects of climate change. However, the question around how much sea level rise and by when 
is something that is deeply uncertain. So for example, when we look at just the studies that came out in the last five years that try to project the amount of global mean sea level rise by 2100 using some of the upper end emission scenarios, we see quite a big range of projections. So this includes this includes um, not only the fifth assessment report showing uh, about 0 0.98 meters to 6 meters, which is done by a paleoclimate study done by Dutton et al. So when we see such a broad range of projection just coming out from study in the last five years, the question that has come up in terms of when we're planning for sea level rise, how much should we be planning for? And so this is only at the global level. So when we're thinking of planning for adaptation, we need to start thinking at the local level. So we need to bring this information down to a local level. And, and by doing that, we are creating even more uncertainties. So for example, when we have the global mean sea level um, rise projections, we need to bring this down to the local level where we start thinking about the local processes that can change the local amount of sea level rise. And there's some uncertainty there, and then that is compounded further when we start thinking of the different socioeconomic processes that can affect the, the actual consequences on the society. So when we think of it in this context, um, the amount of uncertainty around the long-term of sea level rise impact can be quite overwhelming. So what do we do when we are dealing with this overwhelming amount of uncertainty and we have to do something and plan for adaptation? So the literature is suggesting that we need to start moving away from our traditional approach to planning for the future, which is trying to find the optimal option, which is the lowest cost with the highest benefit, but only based on maybe a single best prediction of the future. And the idea is really to try to be as accurate as possible and to eliminate uncertainties. But they're encouraging us to shift towards something called robust adaptation, where we are looking for options that are not necessarily the cheapest and the highest benefit, but they are robust. So these are options that can perform reasonably well across a wide range of futures um, so that it has a higher chance of performing even when the climate digresses from our current predictions. And in order to find these options, we need to consider a much larger number of possible futures. And the idea is really to try to embrace the uncertainties that we're dealing with. So in response to this need for this shift in the way we plan for adaptation, um, the method that is developed here, <coughs> the method being delivered, um, sorry, developed here, is really to try to facilitate this kind of robust adaptation planning. So the method is pretty straightforward. We start by creating a large number of future flood scenarios. So these are spatial, so, so these can be seen as uh, flood, flood depth maps. So we develop a large number of them, trying to span from, <coughs> sorry, um, the worst case or reasonable worst case based on the latest literature to a more optimistic case. And then we can use GIS and different socioeconomic models to try to spatially model the different type of flood impact associated with each of these flood scenarios. So by this stage, we would have a large number of flood impact maps. And these will be fed into a machine learning algorithm called self-organizing maps or SOMS. So what SOMS does is essentially it boils down all these flood impact maps into a small discrete number of archetypes or spatial uh, impact patterns. So each of these can be considered an archetype of how the impact can materialize in that region over a range of future. 
So here I've also put uh, three categories of impacts, so economic, social, and environmental, and we generally would encourage assessments to include um, all three types of impacts. So, um, so actually, before I go ahead to look at the results, I want to just quickly talk about what is this machine learning algorithm SOMS. So SOMS is, a, is actually quite a commonly used machine learning algorithm that is used for pattern recognition, such as facial recognition. So the example I have here on the right-hand side is actually an application of the SOMS on thousands and thousands of satellite imageries of tropical cyclones in the Indian Ocean. So they fed all these imageries into the algorithm and it has produced a hundred archetypes of how these storms can manifest in the in Indian Ocean. And what you will also notice is that SOMS organize um, the patterns according to their similarities. So the ones that are uh, more similar are placed more closely together on the grid and the ones that are more extreme are on the outer end of the grid. So the only difference that in the way that we use this uh, machine, alg al machine learning algorithm is to replace actually <clears throat> instead of satellite imagery um, with flood impact maps. So in our application for the city of Vancouver, we have um, in our first stage, we developed the different future flood scenarios and we have developed 336. And then we use different geospatial models to model 14 different types of sea level rise impact for each of these flood scenarios. So by this stage, I have about 4,700 maps and all of these maps are fed into SOMS. And the last stage, we can identify 16 robust impact patterns for each of the 14 impact types. But before we look at those impact patterns, I want to um, talk a little bit about the flood scenarios themselves. So the 336 flood scenarios, each of them are characterized by five different factors. So each of them have a certain storm return period, a certain amount of sea level rise, a certain um, distribution of population and land use growth, a certain scenario of power outage, and also a certain set of stage damage functions. So in this case, for the storm return period, we have three variations and seven variations for sea level rise, four different kinds of uh, population and land use distribution. Just to quickly go over them, current is based on the population distribution in 20, uh, 2011. The status quo is projected growth that is based on the distribution of our current land use. And the compact is where population and new building is assumed to be um, located in currently densely populated areas and sprawl is the opposite. And then we have two different sets of power outage extent scenarios. So these are hypothetical scenarios that are based on the amount of or the extent of power outage spatially that can incur due to inundation of substations that are located within the um, flooded area, as well as we are assuming that places that are inundated would have their power turned off for safety purposes. So these power outage scenarios would not account for um, power outage due to trees falling on power lines and so on. And then the last, uh, we have two variations of stage damage functions. Um, so these are essentially equations that determines how much of how much of the building would be damaged given a certain amount of inundation. And these kind of equations are very much dependent on where the data was generated to develop these equations. So we have chosen two sets, uh, one from Hazus, which is a model that was created in the US but adopted for Canada. And MCM is the multicolor manual, which is developed in the UK. So by Systematically combining these different variations, we can get the 336 uh, flood scenarios. <clears throat> 
So just to remind you that these scenarios are spatial. So for example, the bottom left here, I'm showing the flood depth map for two meters of sea level rise with one in 500 year storm at the city of Vancouver, and then the associated power outage extent. So um, on the right hand side here, uh, with the green blocks, uh, city blocks would um, in this scenario are expected to experience prolonged period of power outage. So those little triangles are the, where the substations are. So keep this in mind, uh, this also the distribution of these two things in mind as we go into the results. So as I mentioned, um, we looked at 14 different types of impacts at the case study at the city of Vancouver, and these broadly falls into the economic, social, and environmental categories. So for economic, we looked at business disruptions in different major sectors, uh, direct building damage in different major uh, building types, and for social impact, we really want to look at how the different social service facilities could be affected by inundation and or prolonged period of power outage. And this also includes uh, where the vulnerable population might be. And for environmental impact, we looked at the tons of uh, debris that could be generated as well as sewage backup damage potential. So in the interest of time, um, I will look go through three of the 14 impacts, one from each of the categories. So when we're talking about business disruption, um, we are trying to see how many businesses could experience temporary closure due to the disruptions induced by the flood events itself. And the level of disruption is a function of um, which sector the business belongs to, um, how much damage is, um, is subject to the building that the business is residing in, as well as whether the business would have power. So this is uh, based on a business disruption model developed by Chang and colleagues. So here we have the 16 different patterns. So it is quite a lot to look at. So let me walk us through this. Um, so each of these patterns, as I mentioned, is one robust impact pattern. So this is a pattern of how this specific impact can materialize in the study region over a certain range of future. So the number on top of each of these pattern is the total number of businesses that could be affected. And so as we can see, most of the um, patterns on the top right quadrant is showing much higher amounts of disruption. And the bottom left is most of the lower disruption. And, and as I mentioned before, the patterns are organized in terms of their similarity. Although 16 patterns are a lot less than 336, it's still quite a lot for decision makers to consider and integrate into their thinking for planning. So perhaps one of the ways that we can try to interpret this is to look at the range of sea level rise that is associated with each of these patterns. So for example, the top right here, this pattern here is associated mostly, well, actually only with um, scenarios that are um, showing about six meters of sea level rise. And then the bottom left here are patterns associated with zero to one meter of sea level rise. Um, and this bottom right one is about two to three. So we can actually group the patterns in three groups in terms of the range of sea level rise they're associated with. So group A, B, and C. Um, and in this way, we can try to start getting some insight from these different patterns in a more efficient way. So we have group C, which is um, the lower range of sea level rise. We are looking at on average about 900 businesses being affected. And not surprisingly, as we have more uh, higher amount of sea level rise, we would have higher disruption, um, but it would increase quite exponentially. And 
here I have put down the top five hotspots of the affected uh, areas. So um, in all three range, we see that the downtown area is the highest hotspot, which is not surprising given that it has the highest concentration of tertiary sector businesses. But, um, but the hotspots itself do actually change um, when, when we have a different amount of sea level rise. And these maps are pretty small, so we can look at one of them more closely. So I chose the one here about two, two meters of sea level rise, and we can see that the hotspots are these different ones um, here. And I know not everyone is from city of Vancouver, so this might not mean a lot um, to to those who doesn't know the neighborhoods. But, um, but what I did want to point out here is how the pattern of this, um, of this impact, uh, the distribution of the impact across the city uh, strongly aligns with the distribution of the power outage associated uh, with this scenario. So we can see also, this is a good example to show that uh, population and assets that is located outside of the floodplain can also be affected in in in, an, in a different way. So we can also look at the patterns in terms of the specific. Group. So, for example, Group A here is associated with 46 meters of sea level rise, and we can see that there are variations within one group as well. For example, this pattern has the lowest amount of disruption, even though it has five to six meters of sea level rise in comparison to others that might have lower. So what we can do is we can dig a little bit deeper and find that, for example, that we see this pattern as, as well as this one are associated with only the compact land use growth scenarios, whereas the others are a mix of different different ones of the other kind, which is kind of counterintuitive if you think about if we have a compact land use scenario where we would probably put more population and buildings at the coastal areas because those are the areas that are currently uh, densely populated. And if we have more sea level rise, we would think that the compact land use scenario would create higher disruption. So maybe we should look at the other range as well. So in the lower range of sea level rise, we see that the pattern that is associated with compact land use actually produces much higher disruptions in terms of this disruption. So what we actually found is that when we have uh, a compact land use scenario, we do put more population and assets at the coastal areas. But so with initial amounts of sea level rise, we see much higher amounts of disruption. But then as we have continued, um, as we go into higher range of sea level rise, actually the other land use patterns create well, distributes the population and buildings more evenly across the city so that with higher and continued amounts of sea level rise, the amount of disruption will continue to increase. Whereas in a compact land use scenario, we find that actually more of the population assets are located um, away from the coastal areas or away from the area next to the coastal area. So, this is an interesting example to just kind of start thinking about uh, non-climatic and non-physical um, processes such as land use change can play a role in how the magnitude and the spatial variation of um, sea level rise impact can change as well. So here is an example of the social impact. Um, so this is the essentially effect social service facilities, and these include facilities such as homeless shelters, um, free meal locations, on-market housing, childcare and um, preschool centers, community centers, and senior centers. So we also want to look at if they can be disrupted um, not only from inundation but and or power outage. So as we've done before, I've grouped the patterns into the three groups. And 
again, not surprisingly, we can see that on average, a uh, lower amount of sea level rise, we have the lowest amount of disruption. And, but what we can see here, um, what we want to look at is the hotspots. So if we look at the hotspots in about one to, well, zero to one meters of sea level rise up to six meters, even though the initial areas that are um, disrupted is mostly concentrated in the north itself, but with as sea level rise continues, the hotspots actually mostly concentrate and develop um, in the north side, which is actually here is the east side of downtown, where there is a high concentration of social service facilities as well as um, a vulnerable population. So this is another example to show how even though um, the horizontal extent of flooding doesn't actually change that dramatically as we have increasing amount of sea level rise um, due to the topography of the city. Um, but the hotspots and the spatial variation of the impact can change quite dramatically and non-linearly. And the third type is, um, as an example of our environmental impact, is the sewage backup and potential impacts. So sewage backup associated from a overland flooding event um, is quite a common hazard and can potentially create very severe consequences, including different health hazards. So we really wanted to include this impact in our assessment. But when we, at the time, we really couldn't find um, any published uh, indicators or um, indices that measures the risk of sewage backup. Hey. Um, so, as I was saying, um, we were looking for any published um, indices to measure the risk of sewage backup, and and ones that can actually be also be appropriately applied at the city of Vancouver and one that can try to ac account for risk factors of sewage backup inside the home or, or rather say the private side of the property as well as the public side of the property and and we couldn't find one that uh, at the time that that would suit our case here so so we decided to uh, try develop one by ourselves with the help of uh, different staff at the city of Vancouver who are familiar with the drainage system in the city as well as um, drawing a lot from existing literature um, actually many of which are produced by Dan and um, so with the help of different experts and also drawing from the literature we developed a um, this sewage backup damage potential index. I have to say that this index is not measuring the probability of a home experiencing sewage backup during a flood event. Instead, it is measuring the relative level of damage that can be expected from sewage backup in ground related homes at the city block level. So what this is really doing, what we want to see is a index that can show us which neighborhood in the city would relatively be experiencing higher amounts of damage um, from sewage backup should there be a flood event. So the index itself is a function of many different things. Um, it considers the type of drainage system that is connected to the homes in the block, um, whether they would have power outage. So this is relating back to the power outage scenario and whether they are um, relying on sewage pumps um, to pump the wastewater into the municipal system. Um, what is the flood depth if they are within the inundated area and the distance from the nearest flooded area if they are outside the flooded area. Also, we want to think of the amount of exposure. So the number of ground related homes in the block and how many of which are built before the 70s where very little measures have been taken to account for the backflow. So let's look at the patterns. So 
Maybe the first thing you might notice is that the distribution of this impact is quite different to the other two impact that I've shown, which has um, the spatial distribution is very much aligned with where the power outage is experienced and where the inundation is, whereas in this Im uh, impact is quite different. And that is largely attributable to how complicated this phenomena is. It's driven by many different factors. As I've described previously, it's, it has to do with um, whether the homes are constructed before the 70s, whether they are connected to a combined or separated drainage system. So, so if we look at the three different groups, we see that Hastings Sunrise, which is this uh, top, uh, Top right area here is remains the hot spot um, in all three ranges of sea level rise. However, the hot spots, some of them only pops up when we have higher amounts of sea level rise. For example, like Kerisdale and Marpole, um, which are, let me show you in a bigger map, are these two neighborhoods here. So as I mentioned, this impact is um, is somewhat more complicated um, and the, which, which results in the distribution of the impact being quite diff different to the other ones. So I've put here on the right hand side the power outage scenario map associated with this pattern as well as the inundation map. So we can see that even though this area is not uh, experiencing power outage or inundation that much, we do have a hotspot here. And each of these hotspots actually are attributable to different factors. For example, the one here is mostly um, related to how the neighborhood has a higher concentration of homes that are connected to a combined drainage system and do not have sewage pumps. And when we say sewage pumps, we're also thinking of how the sewage pump can serve as a backflow valve as well. And so this one, these uh, hotspots here are related to how it is affected by the power outage area. So this coincides with the power outage area and coincidentally these houses are um, connected to a combined sewage system as well as um, they are, most of the houses here are relying on sewage pumps to pump the wastewater into the municipal system. Whereas the hotspot on the um, top right here, we we, this neighborhood has a very high concentration of pre-70s houses. So so we can kind of start thinking about how different um, characteristics of the houses can relate to different hotspots across the city. So we, we need to start thinking about treating it in, in different ways. So this was quite an interesting impact for us to look at. And, and this is by far not the perfect index. There's a lot of room for improvement. So I look forward to working more on this. Um, so as I said, the third part of the study is where we wanted to start bringing the result back to the users or potential users. So in our case, um, given that we have applied the method to the city of Vancouver, the people we wanna hear from are experts at the city of Vancouver. So we held a expert workshop with a group of 15 experts. So these are people that are either currently involved in planning for sea level rise at the city, or they are subject matter experts in the region. So, so these include staff from BC Hydro, um, city staff from different departments, from planning, development and permits, sustainability and emergency management, but also some consultants that work closely with the cities to plan for sea level rise, and also staff from uh, Natural Resource Canada. So during the workshop, we started with a presentation to introduce the method, what it can do, and also some of the results. And we had a question period where they can, we can address all the different questions if they didn't understand what the result was showing. And, and then we asked them to complete a written survey. 
And the objective of the survey is really to ask them if they think they can use this type of information to support sea level rise adaptation planning in 10 different specific ways. So for example, one of the question is, the robustness of the impact pattern can support development of adaptation options that are more uncertainty tolerant. And then from a scale of one to five, from strongly disagree to strongly agree, they can pick one. And there's also, there was also space for them to explain the answer if they wanted to. But to kind of dig a little bit deeper, we also uh, divided them into different groups for group discussion. And really there we're trying to get at why do they think that um, these type of information can or cannot help um, their planning work. And, and ideally to come up with some practical examples that they can think of. So if we look at the survey results, um, starting with the first five ways, which are mostly related to the development of adaptation options. So one of the ways, for example, is using the patterns to generate new ideas for um, adaptation options, or something like um, supporting long range planning of modification in certain infrastructure. And we can see that um, the majority of participants about 60% or more have responded uh, positively. And when we look at the other five ways that we suggested, for example, um, these are mostly related to using this type of information to help them gain access to resources and stakeholder support. So this could be uh, prioritizing um, their adaptation efforts and resources or using the patterns as a communication tool to communicate the risk of sea level rise to different stakeholders or to identify new types of stakeholders to engage and um, supporting or ju the justification to plan for perhaps a worse scenario than what, what they have been planning before. So out of all these 10, um, well, before that actually, it's not as obvious, but in comparison between ways to um, access resources and stakeholder support versus those ways that to um, develop new adaptation options, there were more um, positive responses from the participants for ways to, um, for these ways to use um, the patterns in terms of adaptation planning. So even though most of the um, ways that we suggested the participants have responded quite positively, the only way that we suggested to use these patterns that has received unanimous agreement was to use the patterns for communicating sea level rise risk. And to figure out why we really drawn from the group discussion outcome. So one of the reason is that the participants think that because the patterns are presented in a spatial, in a map form, um, without a lot of statistics and jargon, they think that the different types of impact can be relevant and understandable to multiple types of stakeholders. And this can potentially create a shared understanding or new conversations across different types of stakeholders and sectors. They also think that perhaps these patterns can help raise awareness within um, a neighborhood level. So because the scale that we have modeled these impacts are at the city block level, some uh, individual that live in a certain block in the city can quite easily go and look at what type of infrastructure that they rely on um, can actually be affected by sea level rise and to what extent. They also suggested that it could be a good tool to educate the, um, the community about cascading effects of coastal flooding. So how, how population and assets that are not located within the floodplain can also be affected indirectly. And this was quite an interesting one by um, to communicate the um, compounding impacts. So what we mean by that is, for example, we can overlay the different impact maps together and identify areas in the city that could be exposed to multiple types of impacts. 
So this is kind of related to um, prioritization. Um, intuitively, we would want to prioritize our efforts in first um, focusing on perhaps areas that has a high concentration of vulnerable population. But on the other hand, if we have identified neighborhoods that um, are okay, but they are um, found to be exposed to multiple types of impacts should there be an event, then perhaps we need to start thinking about those areas as well, even though ultimately we would want to adapt across the whole city. And lastly, and also one of the surprising outcomes that um, came out from the discussions was um, some participants suggested that perhaps this type of, um, this way of presenting the potential impacts of sea level rise could be an easier way to convey to the community how the worst case scenario can look like. Because if we presented the worst case scenario in this one dire, projections, uh, the single scenario that is going to be the worst case, it could be less digestible in comparison to presenting them with a spectrum of how the impact can manifest itself across a range of future. So that was something that was quite surprising and um, could be, uh, I'm really interested in thinking more about that. But here's just uh, two quotes that um, was from the participant. One is a planner at the city that suggested that this can help diversify the risk, not just people that live near water that are affected. It helps to put, on, put it on people's radar. And one of the consultants said, practically the worst case scenario is something we don't want to make even more terrible, and this tool could support this. So. I think in summary, the study have um, developed a alternate approach for, for us to start thinking about the potential impacts of sea level rise at the local level and start to consider a much wider range of future so that we can start thinking about the uncertainties in the earliest stages of planning rather than thinking of the uncertainties when we are at the stage of choosing which adaptation option to implement. And by, by applying the method at the city of Vancouver, we have demonstrated the applicability of the method and also showing the value of including not only direct impact of flooding, but also indirect impacts of flooding. And from the expert workshop, we find that um, even though we had designed this approach kind of mostly to focus on the development of adaptation option, it turns out that maybe this type of information is best used to support adaptation planning as a communication tool. And lastly, um, in order for this method to um, to better support the development of adaptation options, there are cer certainly several ways that we can modify the method or the way that we apply the method in order to better support that. And through the expert workshop, we actually got many suggestions from different participants for this. So that is also creating some exciting future projects for us. So that's it from me. Um, I want to use this chance to thank these organizations that has funded this research or provided in-kind support to make sure everything happened as the way that it did. And thank you very much. So, oh, great. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Jackie. This was an excellent presentation. Uh, very thorough, thorough work. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions, general questions here. I just wanted to head off. Um, so some uh, some attendees are asking if the copy of the presentation is going to be available um, afterwards. So Jackie, hopefully it's okay with you that we post a PDF of your slides on our on our website. People will be able to access them um, that way. Um, so first uh, first question from uh, Paul Kovacs. Uh, so he says this analysis is outstanding. Thank you. Uh, do you plan to extend this research to other hazards in Vancouver? Uh, so first question, uh, do you think you can uh, extend this to other hazards in Vancouver? And do you think that you might be able to apply this approach in uh, other communities? That's a great question. Um, and that's kind of related to 
some of the future plans here. Um, so one of the things that we were thinking of when we um, were working with this method is, um, is is kind of the different compounding impacts, right? So that's what I was mentioning um, in the last, well, second last slide, was to identify areas that could be exposed to more than one type of impact. So if we actually include impacts from different types of hazard, this is potentially a way that we can identify areas that could be exposed to different types of hazard. Um, so. The answer, I guess, is yes. We can we can incorporate um, uh, other types of hazard impacts in this method, um, and to do that, it it's really kind of comes into play in terms of how we design the future flood scenarios or future scenarios in this case, and also which type of impact we want to include in the application. The limitation here, however, is that there is a limited amount of impacts that you want to include in this. Um, if you, um, this has to do with the technicality of the uh, machine learning and how much data you put in there. So it's certainly not a, a method that can be applied to um, uh, maybe 20 or more impacts. So, so that's one, one of the, um, one of the things and and again certainly we can apply this in a different community um, by changing the the input to the to the method um, we I think actually one of the things that came out from the expert workshop was um, perhaps applying this in a um, infrastructure level to specifically look at, for example, some power infrastructure and how different adaptation options can can fare in different future scenarios. So, so in that sense, um, I would say that the method can be quite scalable um, from the infrastructure level up to perhaps a regional level. Um, but again, the model is as good as what you provided um, in terms of data. So if you have the right data available, the method can be adjusted for that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a follow-up question on that. Um, actually, there's a couple of questions uh, related to potential for application in other, other communities, uh, you know, maybe along BC's coast or uh, in Atlantic Canada, uh, are there any plans you might be able to share on on application of your approach uh, elsewhere in in Canada? Um, sorry, did you say the question is whether there are plans to apply it elsewhere in Canada? Right. Right. Um, at the moment, we don't have plans to apply it in elsewhere in Canada yet. Um, so we will. If you have suggestions or any interest, please let us know. Right. Okay. We'll definitely keep that in mind. I think uh, there's quite a few people on the line that uh, will keep that in mind as well. Um, there's a few questions online here about the sea level rise scenarios. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, inputs in the, into the study, but one one key one obviously is the sea level rise scenarios. Um, so one one question from uh, Paul again from Paul Kovacs. Um, so your analysis focuses on sea level rise up to six meters. Uh, the government of British Columbia has given uh, guidance to communities that they must prepare for sea level rise, uh, but I understand the target is one or two meters. Um, so for, and, and there's some questions about why that six meter sea level rise scenario was, uh, was selected. Um, so first question, uh, is there a reason why you uh, selected uh, scenarios all the way up to that six meter uh, sea level rise scenario? And what are your thoughts on uh, what communities should be uh, pre preparing for? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so, so this kind of goes back to uh, the objective of this method. So the objective is, is really to try to provide the user with a spectrum of how the impacts can manifest itself across, across the wide range of possible future. And why I selected up to six meters is purely because one of the, the highest amounts that has come out in published studies have suggested the possibility of six meters. And when we actually really think about it, 
um, in terms of probability of these different projections materializing in the time frame that we're projecting it for, I think is a very difficult question to answer. I don't think we have very good knowledge about the relative probability of different projections, um, especially when we have studies that are using very different methodology to project these, um, these amounts of sea level rise. So the idea for this method is really to try to take into account the absolute worst rain, uh, absolute worst scenario that is kind of reasonable to kind of consider, and then the the lower end of the scenarios. So so it is up to the user to um, to choose what range of future they want to they want to consider. But I would suggest using as wide as possible because then what you are looking at at the end, those robust impact patterns, are the archetypes from this wide range of future. This is why we want to, um, this is why this method is a way for us to kind of start thinking about the uncertainties. How are the di different impact can vary from high end scenarios to low end scenarios? Does that answer okay. the question? <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. And we have some clarification from uh, uh, Thomas online uh, stating that the BC guidance asked for one meter at 2100 and uh, two meters at uh, in the year 2200. Um, so there is a question, another question about inputs. Um, so we've got a question from uh, Malika, uh, who is uh, stating, well, first of all, thank you. Very interesting approach. What was the variation between the two damage functions, MCM and Hazus? Uh, did you find one or the other more applicable uh, to different types of analyses? That's a great question. So, so between the Hazus and the MCM, um, why I chose to those two to include here is um, so the the Hazus is a I think um, I think. Uh, the person asking the question already know that um, Hazus is uh, one of the standard methods to assess this type of impact. So we've included that as a default, but we also know that um, perhaps, um, especially at the city of Vancouver, where we would, um, where we're looking at an ex extensive area of very shallow flooding, the SDFs that are in Hazus might not be able to capture those shallow flooding as well as um, this other set of um, SDFs, which has perhaps finer, inter uh, finer increments as we look at the different flood depth and how much damage is associated with them. So, um, so that is why we kind of try to compensate um, perhaps the shortcoming of uh, the hazards SDFs in that sense, but on the other hand, the hazards SDFs are also very comprehensive in terms of the type of patterns, I mean, uh, the type of buildings that they are associated with. It's a very rich data source, uh, whereas the UK one, it's much, um, is not as rigorous, but it has been developed much more recently and the data is also um, collected uh, in multiple different ways to kind of to triage to the right amount. So they were developed in different method, but they also have different advantages and disadvantages, which is why it's kind of nice to be able to use both of them and try to come and look at the impact resulting from, from kind of a combination of these SDFs. Okay, thank you. Um, another one of the uh, factors that was considered in your analysis was, uh, I guess, develop, development trajectory, um, more compact form versus urban sprawl and, and that sort of thing. And hopefully uh, this right, but looking, uh, thinking back on your uh, earlier slides there, you had examples of, um, or when the, the higher dense density development was considered, there were regions that were affected by uh, during the lower um, sea level rise scenarios, and then under higher sea level rise scenarios, the areas that were affected uh, changed. Uh, could you just uh, maybe describe a little bit in a little bit more detail how that uh, urban form affects uh, future vulnerability and sort of the advantages and disadvantages of, of compact versus less compact form? Mm-hmm. 
Well, I think um, in terms, so firstly, these are, these land use scenarios are hypothetical, but um, I would imagine that by the time it is 2100, these, these land use scenarios would look very different. But um, I think in terms of advantages and disadvantages for um, say compact land use uh, distribution, I think from, from our study, it has manifest in uh, very different ways. So there are, um, for example, in the sewage backup impact, uh, in compact uh, land use scenarios, it has produced much less uh, sewage backup damage potential. And that is directly related to how in a compact land use scenario, we, we would have much more high rise buildings rather than ground related housing. So, um, so in that sense, compact land use, we are reducing in a way um, that, that certain impact. But on the other hand, in business disruption, uh, like we have looked at, it has a positive um, impact initially uh, with the what maybe zero to one meters of sea level rise. But as, but as it continues, it can produce, uh, the direction of the change could change. So, so I would say it is very difficult to say whether a compact land use is better in terms of um, adapting to sea level rise or flooding um, in a broad brush. We really need to consider um, perhaps even at the neighborhood level, what kind of land use um, distribution would be the most advantageous for that specific neighborhood. And perhaps this is a very good opportunity to highlight that how spatially sensitive flooding um, is um, and how the associated consequences are also very spatially sensitive. So, so when we're planning for um, adaptation to flooding, I think um, using a geospatial method is, is definitely a key. Sorry, I think that might have digressed a little bit uh, away from the land use scenario question, but I hope I've answered your question so far. Very, no, very interesting, thank you very much. Um, so there were a couple of questions about the, the sewer backup damage um, findings. And uh, so one thing uh, that uh, we understand Vancouver has committed uh, to um, separating sewer systems in the city and uh, and you had mentioned a number of vulnerability factors, uh, combined sewers, uh, pre-1970s development, reliance on, on uh, sewage ejector pumps. Um, do you have any thoughts about how the sewer system, well, so first question is, what's the mechanism on that, um, on the combined sewer backup? Uh, that's, that's the main concern. Is it inundation of the outfalls and, and sea you know, seawater backing up and through the system, or is it heavy rain? Um, so that's one question is the mechanism in, in that combined sewer area. And the other question is your, your thoughts or maybe some of the, the discussion with the city staff about the separation uh, of the sewer system and how that might affect um, vulnerability in, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so the mechanism in the combined sewage system, we are, we are thinking more about the surcharging of the storm water side of the system from um, inundation and increasing the water table as, as we have higher amounts of sea level rise. And so surcharging from this storm water system into the wastewater system and causing the surcharge in that side of the system to back up wastewater back into the different um, fixtures in the lower level of different homes. Um, but in terms of the separation, yes, um, the city is committed to um, separating the entire drainage system by a certain time. And um, I think, so with that, even if the whole system is separated, we still need to ensure that houses are hooked up into the separated system. So, um, so I guess that is kind of one of the extra steps in, um, in kind of reducing the risk of sewage backup um, when we're thinking of separating um, 
the so uh, the stormwater system from the wastewater system. So whether um, so we so what I'm trying to say is that there's a certain amount of time that we would need to separate the system, and there's also probably a certain amount of time and providing incentives for homes to connect to these separated systems in order to successfully reduce the vulnerability. Thank you, Jackie. Dan? Apologies, I was, I, I was still on mute there. Um, so thanks for that. Um, thanks for that response. Uh, there are a few questions um, from our online participants about the sea level rise scenarios or a few comments, um, some suggesting that maybe that six meter upper level is a little bit too high. Uh, well, at the same time, uh, there is a comment here from Amir um, uh, asking, or I guess the, the question is, is more about the study design, I suppose, and how, um, you know, what's the ideal range of scenarios uh, to, to sort of produce effective results? Um, you know, if we cut out some of these uh, potential future scenarios, um, would that have had a significant limiting impact on the study? Or, you know, maybe there would have been some benefits. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the first question um, or comment about the six meters being too high, it's it's a very reasonable um, thought to have. I, I mean, it is a very extreme uh, scenario, and we don't know what is the probability of that even happening. But then again, the the method itself is not. Um, is not trying to make a projection or prediction rather say of how things are going to be. We are trying to show a spectrum of how things can pan out given this range of future. So, so should the user choose to um, select a different range, it really is just, um, it depends on the user group that they, what are their preferences, what are the, range of future that they are interested in. And I don't think it would be good for us to kind of prescribe a um, the range of scenarios that people should be considering, um, especially when um, I think at the local level, I think there is um, so much variation in the type of projections for local level when we're considering at the global level, there's a little bit more consensus in how things are going. So, so I think that is highly dependent on the context and the community themselves in choosing what kind, what range of future scenarios to consider. And by choosing the six meters, as I mentioned before, it was the highest amount of sea level rise that has been published in the last five years, which is why I included it to show that this is the absolute worst scenario to kind of make a fair spectrum to consider. Um, but if we were going to narrow down this, um, this scenario to uh, say just zero to two meters of sea level rise, there are also advantages in this sense because the patterns might be able to pick out more spatial variations um, that we couldn't pick out when we had chosen a much wider range of um, future scenarios. So, so I guess what can I compare this to is kind of like how how you zoom into a picture. So, so if you have a if you consider a much wider range of future, then you might not be able to zoom into the picture as deeply as if you were going to consider a more narrow way, range. Um, but, but I guess overall, I think it is very context dependent in terms of how wide of a range to consider in this, uh, in this application. 
But also bearing in mind that this method is intended to be used in the beginning stage of the adaptation planning process where, where we are just trying to see how can the impact um, eventuate or materialize given a certain time frame and and start to kind of help with prioritization instead of trying to get at some very precise prediction to get at um, selecting different adaptation options. So um, I hope that kind of answered both question. Right, I, no, I think that was a good, a, a very good response. Um, so maybe one, one last question here from one of our uh, attendees at Mundo. Uh, I think maybe a, a practical question for somebody considering uh, doing uh, or somebody working in a similar field. Um, so you, you identified, uh, sorry, I guess we sort of gathered a number of key data inputs that were required uh, for this work. Um, you know, information on the hydro system, uh, maybe vulnerable hydro vaults that could be inundated, um, information on the, on the sewer system and so on. So, you know, Vancouver is a large city, probably with pretty good resources in terms of data. Um, so what, what were your thoughts on the sort of key, most important data inputs? What were the sort of data gaps that you encountered and, and how did you fill some of the key uh, uh, data gaps that might, uh, in a way that might be helpful for, for some, some people working on similar projects? That's a great question. And I have to say I did spend a very good portion of my PhD collecting data for this study. So <laughs> I'm not going to say that um, it was easy to find all the data for these different impacts. But the city of Vancouver certainly is a is a good area to do this since the city do have a rich source of data. Um, however, we did still come across data gaps. Um, for example, in the sewage backup uh, damage potential index, one of the factors is um, whether homes have sewage pump. And there wasn't, there aren't actually very uh, solid data on that and we had to make some assumptions about that. And that was uh, related to the policy in the city that um, there's a fixture restriction. So if the lowest slab of the um, building is located below the geostatic height uh, or geostatic level, then the home um, should uh, uh, should have a sewage pump installed, but um, but without doing a building assessment, we wouldn't be able to know for sure which homes have a sewage pump. So in this case, we had to assume that all the homes with this lowest slab is below the geostatic um, level do have a a sewage pump when in fact um, we don't know for sure if all of them do. So um, so there was a little bit of the gymnastics in, in trying to make data work and finding the some proxies to kind of fill some variables that we couldn't get uh, solid data for. And, um, but to answer the question of what are the key variables, I think um, I, I think, as I mentioned before, the type of impact that you choose to put into this uh, this method is highly context dependent. So, so depending on which impact you want to assess, it will completely drive the type of data that you would require. So I don't know if I can comment on uh, what type of data is the most important to collect. Um, certainly including some lifeline uh, information such as like the power and the water, um, the availability of that can certainly play a big role in the indirect impact of flooding. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, thanks very much, Jackie, for a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, it was really good to learn more about your, your project and, and uh, methods applied. Um, before we sign off, uh, maybe do you have any, any last, last thoughts? Um, well, I would welcome any feedback from uh, the audience if they have more thoughts about this work or interest in um, applying this method. So, um, yeah, I hope this has uh, brought some new ideas to you. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, and so please do contact uh, Jackie, if you if you have comments or, or thoughts about her work.
Um, and thanks again, Jackie. And so before, we, okay, <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, before we sign off here, I just want to remind uh, the the attendees that we have another Friday forum coming up on March uh, March twenty second. Uh, it will be Julian Bermelo from Environment Climate Change Canada, and uh, we'll uh, we'll be hearing about his uh, uh, hail work. Um, and with that, uh, we'll sign off here. Thanks again for joining.